<laughs> Today has just been crazy pants. <laughs> We're in a national state of emergency. My son is home from school. <laughs> There's no food in the grocery stores. Man, you know, living in New York, it's something else going on right now. Everything is like in an uproar. Everything is just a mess. So, of course, I go live on the, the thing that I was trying to go live on just now and my computer disconnects from the internet. <laughs> it's kind of, it's so bizarre. The world is just so bizarre right now. Um, but I'm here. We're gonna talk about stuff. It's gonna be great. <laughs> and and we're going to have a nice chat and discussion here today. So hopefully I can get my computer running where I'll have my notes. Uh, I can share my notes with y'all today because I had some really great things to share. Um, but if you are joining me here on the call, I invite you to type your name and where you are coming from in the chat box there. And um, I'll give you a little shout out. Popping in for a live stream here today to try to talk about anxious partners. And in particular, we're going to be exploring how can a partner that has a more avoidant attachment style connect with an anxious partner in the ways that won't trigger them. So it's interesting on the comments of the last live stream I did, um, someone said, why is it that everybody's always trying to tell um, anxious partners how to talk to avoidant partners? Why isn't there anybody who wants to talk to avoidant partners about how to talk to their anxious partners? Well, my friend, today is that day. <laughs> and if I can get this phone to stick on this tripod, there we go. I can stop shaking and you don't have to get motion sick this whole time we're together. Because I, I know what it's like to be motion sick. I get, I get terrible motion sickness. All right. Yay, people are joining us. Great. Welcome. Thank you for joining me here on this interesting day in this interesting time of history. <laughs> I'm trying to center it a little bit here. Um, so I would be interested to know while I'm pulling up my notes here, for those of you that have joined me, if you feel as though you may be someone who has a more avoidant attachment style or if you feel as though you may be someone who has an anxious attachment style, I would be interested to know what what you think, where you think you fall. Um, and again, this is I, as most of you know, I tend to think of attachment styles as being more dimensional. Um, so even if even if you feel as though you might primarily um, have more of an anxious attachment style, you may have some avoidant tendencies or you may notice within yourself that there are some avoidant tendencies that you have. And so today we're really going to be addressing that piece, right? Um, so yes, yes. So mentioning if I actually like the guy. Yeah, so sometimes it's contextual, right? Sometimes um, our partner's attachment styles can affect the way that we express ourselves. I, I often hear from individuals that when they are, when they're with a partner that is like, let's say more avoidant than them, then they tend to be more anxious. Or if, if they, if an anxious partner meets someone that is more anxious than them, then they find themselves becoming more avoidant, right? So, so these things are, in my opinion, much more dimensional than, than they're frequently talked about, especially when they're categorical. So, um, I think that's why it's useful to kind of examine the ways in which we express ourselves so that we can just be more mindful about how we are communicating what is, I'm going to call the authentic self, but what is our actual experience that we're having, right? As opposed, and I call that a deep structure communication as opposed to a surface structure communication. So, so I want to dive into our content here for today. I finally managed to get my computer back on up and running. Um, okay. So today we're going to be talking about anxious partners and five explosive trigger statements to avoid and what to say instead. So this video could be particularly useful for someone who leans more towards avoidant rolling stone attachment style if you're looking for some assistance in how to express yourself so that it doesn't lead to a fight. Um, or this could also be for someone who has a more anxious, open-hearted attachment style who's looking for ways to explain to their partner how they can communicate in such a way that it doesn't create a triggering response, right? And I wanna share this information here today because 
I truly believe that relationships are intended to be deeply satisfying and supportive and fun and playful. And yes, they require effort, but it is not, to, not supposed to be painstaking work, right? Our loving relationships are supposed to be a refuge from that kind of work. And I believe that you do not have to be perfect before attracting, recovering, or revitalizing the perfect love in your life. You just have to need to know how to communicate in a way so that your partner understands what it is that you actually mean so that you can also get your needs met. And I would say that this is not always easy for an avoidant rolling stone because they may be struggling with knowing what their needs are exactly and then being able to articulate them in such a way that it doesn't come across as callous or uncaring or too aloof, right? And so this is particularly true, I would say, if you have an anxious, open-hearted partner who tends to be kind of hypersensitive to those types of communications. And so if you are an avoidant rolling stone and you struggle to kind of get your point across, but you're worried about hurting someone else's feelings, or even if you are an anxious open heart that wants to teach your partner how to communicate with you better, then I invite you to stick around with me for this live stream video because we're gonna explore these five triggering statements and these are statements that avoidant partners tend to use. Um, and they can be very, let's say, um, stimulating or triggering for anxious partners. And I'm also going to make some suggestions on what you might say instead, or at minimum giving you a process by which you might be able to come up with on your own a statement that feels true to your situation. So before I dive too much more deeply into that, if you are just joining me here on my channel for the first time, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam and I'm a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator, and I've been in the field for about 14 years now. And I am just wild about love and attachment styles, particularly in adulthood. And it's my mission to help adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to what I call self-sovereign so that they can experience those soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using the McWilliam method, which is comprised of three principles and tools, and that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experiential. So here today we are doing some cognitive reframing and that means we're going to start to shift the way that we think about our possibilities for love in the world and also the ways in which we communicate with our partners. And so I put out videos on Mondays and Thursdays. Sometimes they will be a live stream like this. Sometimes they're pre-recording. Um, and usually I will pop in at the end of the month to just do strict live Q and A. So make sure that you like, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so you can join me for those event events and occasions. Okay, so one of the things I wanna start with as we dive into these statements is that a lot of us have a tendency to think that our partners see, experience, and understand the relationship in the same way that we do, and that they would have the same expectations or standards for connection. And so we have a tendency to assume, well, if I could just learn to express myself better, then, then they will get it, and then they'll act the way I want them to act, right? And then they won't take offense, because then they will know, right? And so we think that just, if we can just increase our ability to be emotionally honest, then that's just gonna fix all the problems. But that really just simply isn't the case because even if you express yourself as accurately as you ever could, that doesn't mean the other person experiences it the same way you do. And that doesn't mean they're gonna value the thing the, thing the way that you are valuing the thing, right? So for example, if you're more avoidant, if you're a more avoidant rolling stone and your partner comes home after having a bad day, you might decide that you should give them some space because that's what you would want. Time and space helps you process things without feeling, let's say, overloaded or overwhelmed or responsible for other people, right? It, it helps you to take some time out so you don't feel responsible for other people feeling upset about you feeling upset. It feels kind of like burdensome to you. So you understand that. So out of empathy and your own perceptions of what someone might need in that situation, you give them some space, you, give, you let them be alone to process things. But if you have a partner that has a more anxious disposition or a more open-hearted disposition, that might actually be the opposite of what your partner actually needs and wants in that moment. So maybe all they really wanted was some soothing, a sympathetic ear, physical comfort for you, from you. And when you give them space, now they start to feel worse 
right? Because they think that you're abandoning them for having uncomfortable feelings. They take it as a criticism that they are too intense for you and that you can't handle them, okay? But you may feel like that was not at all what you intended. From your perspective, you were just trying to be respectful of what they were going through. Because isn't it easier to be around people that don't burden you or emotionally barrage you when you're going through something that's deeply private and personal? And aren't you showing them respect by giving them the space to go through that? But if that's not how your partner receives it, round and around and around we go, right? So the only way to get off a hamster wheel like this is to really stop and take a look at how we're communicating and what we are communicating so as to make sure that we are sending uh, and receiving messages that we actually mean on, on both sides, right? And so today for the avoidant rolling stone, I wanna talk about these five triggering statements that they would likely want to avoid in partnership, particularly if they have an open-hearted partner and also make some suggestions on what to say instead, okay? Now, I want to just add that similarly to our live stream from last week, these statements were gleaned from a survey that I did of my list, which at the time was about 15,000 subscribers. And of that sample, 200 people responded. And so these were five triggering statements. They are representative of, they are representative of the majority of responses I got from um, anxious open hearts who felt that these were triggering statements for them. Okay. And also what I might recommend saying instead was, is also um, influenced by what they said they would like to hear instead, okay? So the first state triggering statement from Rolling Stones is, you are overreacting. Now, just let me see if I can check out the chat here. There we go, now I can see y'all. How many of you would say that um, you have either said you're overreacting or someone has said to you that you are overreacting and you could just type it yes or no in the chat box there and um, we have Nikki we have Chris hello we have naturally me hi there welcome thank you for joining me we have Lauren Veronica hi thanks for joining we have from LSA nice to have you here Claudia thank you for joining me so Okay, we said yes, yes, someone has. Okay, good. So similarly to the way we talked about this on our live stream from last week, we're gonna follow a similar sort of sequence of self-reflection and questions that we can kind of examine to see if what we are communicating is, is actually what we mean and intend, right? So the first question we ask ourselves is, what am I hoping to accomplish? So, so when you tell somebody you're overreacting, what would you, what do you think the goal is? And remember the goal is usually an external um, action oriented thing. So when someone says you're overreacting, the person who is saying that, what are they trying to accomplish? And you can uh, type your guess in there. Usually you're trying to accomplish the diffusion of some kind of uncomfortable situation, right? You're overreacting. Well, why are you responding in that way? Well, because something about their reaction is causing a stir in your reaction, right? And you're having a negative response to that. And so, or at least a resistance to it. And so when you say something like that, you're trying to dismiss the expression so that you can diffuse a, an uncomfortable situation. So that's usually the goal, to get them stop acting or expressing themselves in the way that they are expressing themselves because you're experiencing discomfort around it, right? And But what are you intending with that? like? What is the emotional intention? Protection, Tracy says protection. Yeah, you might be wanting to protect your feelings. So you may be intending to reduce anxiety in your partner, right? To convince them that it's not necessary so that, as you said, you can experience a reduction of anxiety as well, right? So you will, that, but bots, bots, okay, if that's the goal and the intention, then how do you imagine your partner who is in that state is actually going to receive that kind of statement. Like how how would you how do you take that in? For any of you that have heard that, how did it how did it feel when someone said that to you, right? Now, most people will experience that as dismissing, as invalidating and devaluing of their reality and their emotional experience because just because it's not your experience. And so it, it can come across as kind of a ignorant, self-absorbed or egocentric statement to make, right? Invalidated or dismissed. So, so what is something that we can say instead of 
you're overreacting. If we know that we are now feeling anxiety as a result of someone else feeling anxiety and you're trying to diffuse the anxiety, what is something aside from dismissal that we can express that is honest and true to what you're feeling in that moment? So you might say something like, you know, I know what it's like when something feels really important. And even though I may not totally understand why this specific thing is so important to you, your feelings are really important to me. And I can connect to that feeling of being overwhelmed. And you know what, that's enough for me. So please help me out and tell me how I can support you in this circumstance, right? So you're trying to allow for your partner to have their feelings. You're allowing for it to be important in their experience because it obviously is right? But also you're allowed to have your experience as well, which is it may not be that big a deal to you, but that's okay. That's okay. It's okay for it to not be that big of a deal to you and for it, and it's okay for it to be a big deal for your partner. But what's important to you really, what's really important to you is that your partner feels loved because you love them and there's nothing worse than loving someone who doesn't think you love them, right? So that's the part that you assure them of. And, and, that, and that they feel valued by you. So the thing that you do value about them is their felt experience. Even if their felt experience is causing you some discomfort, right? You can connect with the feeling of overwhelmment. You can connect with the feeling of something important not going your way, right? So even though in the, in the content of it, the context of it, it may not be something that you would feel a strong reaction to. You can connect to the feeling of having a strong reaction, maybe to something else that's important to you. And that's where you find that bridge between you, right? Um, okay, so the second statement, I'm actually gonna combine statements two and three together because they usually kind of go together. And it is, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's the second one. And the third one is, that must be hard for you, right? I'm sorry you feel that way, that must be hard for you. So in, in that moment, and you could just maybe type it in the chat box there, if anyone's ever said that to you or if you have ever said that, you know, just type a yes or a no in the chat box there so I know. Now we're gonna go through the same process here. So what in that moment would you say you're hoping to accomplish? What's the external action oriented goal? What outcome are we trying to affect? It's a non-apology, right? It comes across as a non-apology. So really what we're trying to accomplish is credit for expressing a form of sympathy without actually empathizing with the emotion. And so usually Rolling Stones will do this for one of two reasons. And the first is you either refuse to empathize because it reminds you of a childhood that's full of emotional ma manipulation and there's no way you're gonna make yourself vulnerable to that again. Or secondly, it's because you have a limited emotional vocabulary and you don't know how else to respond, right? So, so this statement is the closest thing that you can come up with to expressing empathy because you don't have the vocabulary to express it otherwise, okay? Now, as a side note, um, if you perceive most forms of emotional honesty as forms of emotional manipulation, then you'll likely experience a lot of irritation and resistance to the suggestions that I'm making in this video. <laughs> because at the root of, you know, your ideas about love and relationships is typically a belief that they are contingent on a power dynamic. And whoever has the upper hand, if that is the case, um, you know, they're the ones that are in control of the relationship, okay? Now, if that's something that you feel like applies to you, then I would invite you to check out um, a couple other videos on my channel and then maybe come back to this one. The first one's called Power Hungry and Emotionally Unavailable in Love. I'll put the links to these in the caption of this video. The second one is two types of emotional unavailability, fearful versus dismissive avoidance. And the third one is three strengths of the spice of lifer. Okay, so that's just kind of a side note um, to this. Now, so we have what we hope to accomplish, and then we have what we intend. So typically the intention is to appear reasonable and agreeable while at the same time establishing a boundary that is basically saying, I can see you're upset, but I don't get it. And I'm not going to accept responsibility for your feeling that way or for trying to make it better for you, right? And that's usually a response to 
um, kind of old baggage where anybody's emotional honesty feels like a criticism, right? So then we respond defensively. Now the intention tends to be one of attempting to be the good guy while at the same time establishing boundaries that deep down you anticipate your partner doesn't respect or acknowledge, right? With a deep distrust of relationships, okay? So the intention becomes one of drawing a very rigid boundary line, okay? So, but why do we draw rigid boundary lines? Because we're trying to create a scenario in which connection remains tolerable to us. So even though there's sort of, it's sort of like a deeper layer there, the defenses are a little bit thicker there, it's still an attempt to maintain connection, okay? So now how does the partner experience a statement like this, right? Um, I'm sorry you feel that way, that must be hard for you. How do they experience it like that? And I might just pose that to those of you here on the call with me. You can type there in the chat box if that's ever been stated to you or if you have ever stated it, you know, how do you imagine when someone might receive a statement like that? You know, usually they experience it as defensive, which it is, you know, it might be. And so they often respond in an annoyed and defensive fashion as well. And this comes across to them as you're being condescending to them, that you're rejecting them, you're dismissing them. It's a form of emotional abandonment. And, and you're kind of doing it in sort of a, it almost comes across as passive aggressive in a way, right? Feeling rejected, right? Translating into that's your problem. So you're kind of up shit's creek without a paddle and I'm not gonna help, I'm not gonna swoop in with a life vest, right? Um, so they think you don't care about them and that you might even find them, you know, annoying and burdensome. And now they feel like we're falling into that game that happens in the anxious avoidant trap where you're being villainized, right? You're villainizing them for having emotions, right? And so you're creating some distance. Oh, that's bad for you. And in, in a way you're kind of, you're assuming that they are trying to obligate you to something. And so now they're on the opposite side, right? They're on the opposite side of the camp. They're way over there. They're sort of, you know, they're your enemy now. And so then they respond by turning you into the enemy. When we express ourselves defensively, we inspire defensive responses. And that is essentially what we define as a triggered response, right? And so what happens is your partner starts to feel triggered themselves. They may have a childhood history, hood history of feeling like a burden, feeling abandoned, feeling um, emotionally dismissed or, or, or disregarded. And so now they start to distrust you, right? Now they start to distrust you and they feel belittled um, and they feel as though they cannot depend on your support. So now they're going to oftentimes, if they experience a strong emotion moving forward, suppress it, they're gonna start you know, slipping into performance mode, lying about what they actually feel and want because they don't trust you with it and they think they're too intense for you now, right? So what can be said instead? Well, here's a suggestion. Tell me more about what you're feeling because I want to understand it in your experience. Maybe if I can better understand where you're coming from, we could come up with solutions together. I genuinely want to know what words would make you feel better because I wanna be there for you in the ways that you need and I'm, feeling like I don't have the vocabulary right now. But if you help me out with that, I think I could make it work, right? I could give it a shot. Not making any promises, but I could give it a shot. So, so asking, like just asking. Now, of course, this means that we have to, in order to access a communication like this, we have to move beyond, be in our own work and move beyond a lot of layers of defensive posturing, right? And that's why I said um, for, it depends on what kind of avoidance you struggle with. If it's a type of avoidance where you perceive emotional honesty as an assault upon you or as a criticism of you, then you probably have fearful avoidance and there's some deeper layers you got to work through there. And I recommend checking out those three videos in the caption of this um, video, which I will include the links to that. If you're someone who struggles with this, not necessarily because you are, you're assuming a power dynamic or you're assuming that they are trying to invade your boundaries, but because you simply feel as though you don't have the emotional vocabulary and language for it, and you're a bit perplexed as to why your partner doesn't understand how much you care, then you might be a bit more able to access these types of tools at this time, okay? 
Now, the, the fourth statement that comes up a lot is, you must have done something to cause this, right? You must have done something to cause this. So what are you trying to accomplish? You, when you say something like, you must have done something to cause this, what do you suppose the external action-oriented goal might be with a statement like that? What's the outcome we're trying to affect when we say something like that? And, um, you know, it, it, if you've heard this, what do you think it is? If, if you've stated this, you might, you know, pop an idea of what you think it might be in the chat box there. But what I would say is that I think typically the goal here is to deflect blame and responsibility that you anticipate is eventually going to be cast in your direction and or to inspire your partner to be more proactive in your opinion so that they can be in better control of themselves and you don't have to feel affected by their angst and thus responsible for fixing it for them, right? So, so if that's the case, then what are you intending? What's the emotional desire there? Well, it could be to make your partner feel empowered by taking a personal responsibility, right? That's sort of an underlying idea that says, if you caused it, then that must mean that it's within your power to fix it. And isn't that a comforting thought? Go ahead, champ, you can do this, you got it, right? So sometimes avoidant Rolling Stones have a kind of a tough love way of expressing themselves and it can come across as very dismissive and blamey and deflective of responsibility um, or of, of criticizing you for not doing better. But when they express themselves in that way, they actually think that they're empowering you because in their own psyche, in their own psyche, they believe they take on that because if it's if I take that on, then I can fix it. Isn't, isn't that empowering? So here, you should take on this way of thinking about things too because you'll feel empowered by it. Meanwhile, someone who has a more open-hearted attachment style does not feel empowered <laughs> by that. They feel criticized and judged, right? They feel abandoned. Like you're not empathizing with me right now. You're judging me and you're trying to force me into a new state of, of feeling and, and being that I am not in which feels like judgment, right? Okay, so that's kind of where we are going with the next question, which is how your partner experiences and receives a statement like that. So overall, they might experience that as punitive, as shaming, as victimizing, as critical of their capabilities and their agency. They might experience it as you having a distrust in them, right? Um, if, if they were, if it were within their power to prevent something negative from happening, don't you think they would have prevented it from happening in the first place? And if you don't think that, then you obviously don't trust their agency and must have a low opinion of them. Plus you're insulting their intelligence, right? They may very well know how to fix it, but what they want is your empathy for how you're feeling in the moment. And the idea that they should somehow you know, fix something to avoid feeling altogether is a dismissal of the idea that all feelings are worth having and worth sharing, right? So that's how they might receive something like that. So what, what could we say instead? Well, this is just a suggestion, but it could be something like, how can I best support you in this moment? Do you want help with problem solving or do you just need to vent? I, you know, I'm down to help you with either one and I trust that you know what you're doing. Even though you think you don't, I know that you have the ability to figure this out. But just let me know what I can offer in terms of help and support and I will tell you what I can do, right? So, so it's just being curious, basically. Like just being curious and being willing to be curious and not jumping 10 steps ahead to fix it mode, just trying to be present in the moment, acknowledging what's happening in the moment, and then noticing in your own body, your own feeling states, where you start to feel some tension or anxiety, worrying about, I don't know if I can help them with this. And then asking yourself, do I need to help them with this? Is this a problem I actually need to solve? Or is this more a moment where I need to just be still? And that is the action of inaction, right? I read a book by uh, John Gray once, talks about, I think it's Mars on fire and Venus on ice or something like that. And he talks about how sometimes for partners who, who need to be in fix it mode, if you're someone who need, just needs them to listen, then give them something to do while you're expressing yourself. So for example, here, can you hold this bag of garbage? And while you're holding that, let me just tell you about this thing, right? Or can you rub my feet while I tell you about that? So 
there's something they're physically actionably doing while you're expressing what you're expressing and it makes it easier for them to take in the information and not have to jump into fix it mode so that they are a better listener for you and they also feel more capable of giving you what you need because you're giving them um you're giving them a, an activity to do while while they're giving you what you need so that it's easier for them to give that to you that just popped into my head while we were talking about it so so those are some suggestions and of course for those first four statements and of course again these are these are just suggestions, right? These are just ways of thinking about it. But what I'm really trying to offer you is a structure by which you can kind of plug in your own information and plug in your own personal experience, right? So we do have one more, um, and this is the fifth one. And the last one is, I will return when you're more reasonable, okay? So again, you can just type there in the chat box if anyone's ever said that to you, I'll come back when you're more reasonable. You know, I'll come back when you're calmed down, right? So when we say something like, I'll come back when you're more reasonable or I'll return when you're, when you're calmed down, you want to ask yourself again, what's the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? What's the external action oriented thing going on there? And I would suggest it is probably to escape a situation that feels out of your control and or emotionally threatening or irritating to you. So, so you're trying to, you're trying to withdraw from something that you feel like is hard for you to sit with and that is out of your control, right? And so what are you intending with that? Well, you want to give your partner space. That is a genuine desire. You want to give your partner space because you want them to get control of themselves and behave in a way that you believe is a more proper manner, right? So which we might call a more subdued, reasonable way of being, thereby kind of recovering your own emotional equilibrium and your own ability to be with them without a fear of becoming dysregulated yourself. Now, I wanna add something to this. This isn't necessarily bad. If you're in a situation with someone who's raging, for example, who's completely lost control of their faculties, this may actually be your only recourse because that's a form of destructive anger and anything that happens in, in engagement with that person at that time is not gonna be useful or helpful. It's, it's not gonna be productive. It's gonna be about hitting below the belt. It's gonna be about tearing down your character. They are going to be deep in an inner child tantrum, right? So there is, you're gonna to have to use your discernment around how far down the rabbit hole have we fallen in this heated situation, right? How far down the rabbit hole have we followed, have we fallen? Now there is, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's worth it to just have it out. You know, we can't all escape every argument. Sometimes that's actually what allows us to get to the next side or the next level of intimacy that we are searching for. Okay, you wanna have it out, let's have it out. Uh, you know, you may have you may have lost touch of the deep connection and the reasons that you're here in this relationship, but I haven't. And so if if you feel like you need to scream and and, you know, let loose, let's do it. Ah, let's throw shit. Let's do it. Right. Here we are. Here's the angry feelings. Here they are. Doesn't mean I don't love you. But I can be angry, too. Right. So, and of course, there are limits with this. There are, there are limits with this. Obviously, if someone puts a hand on you, you're out, you're out, right? If someone starts degrading your character and you find yourself slipping into um, an abusive situation, out. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And you're not gonna have a productive conversation. But sometimes there can be the experience of being able to have the angry feelings in the presence of someone else that allows you to get to a next level of intimacy. So you're going to have to use your, use your judgment here. Is this an angry circumstance where we can actually meet on the level of anger and allow that to be an experience that later deepens our intimacy? Or is this an experience where we're heading into the, the, the direction of destructive anger? Right, and if you wanna learn more about that, I do have a, a video on my channel called The Nine Faces of Anger that talks a little bit more about this, okay? Um, but, you know, usually when we have a strong withdrawal response to anger, it's because we have our own issues with conflict and that is because we struggle with boundaries, right? So 
withdrawal, the intention typically is that if I stay here, then our connection is threatened because I'm, I don't, I'm not able to hold these feelings and it's going to fracture our connection. So I'm going to leave in order to preserve the connection. Okay. That's usually what the leaving partner is experiencing. Okay. So how your partner experiences a statement like that, I'll come back when you're more reasonable. The word reasonable is particularly triggering here, right? Like, oh, so in order to be logical and reasonable, I have to abandon emotion. I can't have a felt experience, right? So there's a split there. You know, it's evidence of a split that's going on. And so your partner's going to experience that as condescending, dismissive, invalidating. It basically tells them that uncomfortable feelings and emotions are not allowed, which is a function of conditional love, right? And again, you can't handle it, therefore you can't handle them in their intensity. And so as a result, they, they actually experience you not as strong, but as weak. They experience you as weak and as emotionally fragile, though you may think in that moment you are outwardly portraying yourself as being anything but, right? And they also will start to feel that you are unable to see them and know them for who they really are, and so then they will start hiding who they really are. And that tells them that love is conditional and that they increasingly do not feel safe expressing themselves fully with you. And so they will put on that mask and continue doing the performance act just to keep the peace in the relationship and keep you around because their attachment system is inflamed, right? And that can lead to a feeling of walking on eggshells around you. It can lead to unvoiced resentments that build up over time. Inevitably, it can result in your partner becoming increasingly anxious and depressed for seemingly no reason because they are turning their anger, unexpressed anger in on themselves. And so alternatively, or we might say additionally, they could demonstrate intermittent explosions of anger, which might seem disproportionate in the moment, but in the greater context of the whole relationship, it's actually been accumulating. It's an accumulated response to ignored bids for emotional contact over time, right? So what's something that you might say instead of, I'll leave and come back when you're more reasonable? Now again, the, cave the caveat to this is that there's no physical violence going on and there's no, um, deep-seated emotional abuse going on in this situation. You're just expressing angry feelings, right? So what you just got a call. So what you might say instead is something like, I don't want to invalidate your feelings or abandon you in this moment, but it's really hard for me to engage in conversation because I'm feeling my own anger rise in response to yours. And I don't see this heading in a healthy or productive direction for either of us. So I need to take some space so I can come back with a cool head and be better equipped. And if you can give me that, I think that I can better meet you on this topic, right? So the more I feel pushed, the more I will pull away. And ultimately, I don't want to do that because I do value your connection. And I want you to feel like you can express your feelings with me. But right now, I don't, I am feeling like I'm not going to be able to give you what you need if we continue in this, in this way, right? Now, obviously, the way I'm expressing myself is very even-tempered. Right. But you can say words like you can obviously use your own words attaching to the sentiment with heat to them. There can be heat in your voice. We don't we, we don't have to avoid anger. Right. Anger can be constructive as much as destructive. And part of it is knowing when you've crossed the line between constructive and destructive. Right. So you can have heat in your voice, but but still expressing the sentiment almost always in an argument what we are doing is looking for connection. And we're, we're, we're doing it in a way that unfortunately tends to have the opposite effect. It severs our connection. So if you can try to keep in mind that in every conflict, almost always the person is looking to reestablish a connection, they're just doing it in a way that works against them. If you can be the partner that is able to hold that essential premise beyond whatever the ego's defensive response may be in that moment, then you can shift the direction of the conversation, right? So I hope that you have enjoyed today's content. Um, because it is such a bizarre day, <laughs> my son is actually home from school because of the coronavirus and will be until the end of April. So um, this has been a very unplanned day. Um, but I, I see that there are some comments popping up in the chat and I'm going to go back over those comments um, 
once we finish here and I will be popping in at the end of the month to do some impromptu live streams towards the last week of the month. So I see your comments. Thank you for sharing them and for being participatory in the call. Um, and I will be popping in at the end of the month to address some of the questions that have been raised um, on the content that we have published this month. So thank you so much to all of you for joining me here today. I hope you all stay safe. Remember to wash your hands. Remember to sanitize. <laughs> Remember to social distance. <laughs> and um, I will see you at the end of the month. Thank you so much, everybody.